Hi, welcome back to class. I wanted to begin to talk a little bit about Jesus the Messiah. And I want to give three categories that you can use to connect Jesus' life with the Old Testament and help us to think through, using these three categories of prophet, priest, and king, what Jesus accomplishes ultimately on the cross and in the resurrection. But let's talk through some of these things a little bit. Again, I've titled this lecture, Jesus the Messiah. And Messiah, as you know, is equivalent to Christ. And this in and of itself is actually a royal term. So I, I want you to see that when we're talking about who Jesus is, the, Old, the New Testament understands Jesus as, a, as Messiah, as the long-awaited king through whom God is going to restore the kingdom. This immediately connects us back to David. So the overarching image of Jesus as the Christ, or even Jesus as God's son, these are royal terms, and so I'm going to deal with those ultimately last. But let's take a look at these other ones. Jesus as prophet. Now, as we reviewed through the Old Testament, we had a chance to read the prophets. Uh, we noted how the prophets did a couple of different things. They had uh, two, primary, two primary messages. They called God's people to realign or to return or to repent and get back to that original ethos that God had established in Mount Sinai. So in other words, the prophets had a call, had a vocation to call God's people to return back to their roots and to live as God's missional people that were called to reflect and embody God's character to the world, in the world, and for the world. And so Jesus, in many ways, comes as a prophet. Uh, John the Baptist was, in a, in, a, in a sense, the last of the prophets, but Jesus himself had that prophetic role. Texts such as Matthew 5, uh, 17 to 48, where Jesus essentially retells, Jesus speaks God's word and calls God's people back. And at the same time, what is Jesus? Jesus isn't just a prophet. Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophetic vision. Jesus comes as not just one who speaks the word of God or who even speaks as God, but Jesus comes incarnate, God in the flesh, to be God's living word. John's gospel makes a big deal out of this where it talks about the word became flesh and dwelt among us. I'm going to speak about that again when we get to talking about Jesus as a priest. But Jesus pulls the Old Testament together in terms of bringing to fulfillment that role of prophet. Secondly, Jesus pulls together this whole idea of priests. So when we talk about priests, uh, we're talking about sacrifice, We're talking about a teaching function, even though that has some overlap with the prophet. Uh, we're talking about uh, dealing with sin, functioning as a mediator. And we're even talking about mission, if you will, as well. So we can put all those categories together in this idea of priest. And we read through the books of uh, Leviticus, the last part of Exodus, especially Exodus 19 to 40, and parts of Deuteronomy really focus on the priesthood and their role in ancient Israel. Again, the priests took care of helping Israel to function as that holy nation. They taught the law. They gave order to God's people. They ran the cult, the worship, the sacrificial system, all the things that had to take place so that a holy God could dwell in the midst of, of, of people. That began with the tabernacle in Exodus and ultimately extends all the way into what happened with Solomon's temple once Solomon's temple was, was created and dedicated there in, in uh, 1 Kings 8. And so this priestly role, it was vital. And uh, the New Testament picks this up. And so Jesus, in his death, functions as a high priest. We'll say more about these things as we get into to some of the other uh, New Testament passages. One of my favorite 
texts, just to look ahead to the rest of the New Testament, is from the book of Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 4, and this pictures Jesus as a high priest, verses 14 through 16. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so Jesus comes as a priest, as a person that connects people with God. Now Jesus himself is God, and one of the big events that takes place after at his death is the access to the temple shifts. At Jesus' death, and you can read about these in the Gospels, that the temple veil that separated people from the Holy of Holies is ripped in half, which symbolically shows that Jesus as a priest has made access to God uh, that much easier. We also see Jesus as a priest even talking about his own death the night before when he has the, the Last Supper with his disciples where he essentially institutes uh, the sacrament of, of communion. As, uh, as, an, as a celebration, that a meal that God's people are going to celebrate, to remember his death, to reflect on uh, his passion, to announce to the world the good news of his uh, saving death. Jesus functions in a priestly way there and, and again pulls together these categories of sacrifice. Jesus' death is an atoning death. Uh, his teaching, he teaches the word of God. His mediatory... Uh, role where Jesus connects humans to God. Jesus comes and lives that pure life. Jesus is both the priest and, in a sense, the perfect sacrifice all embedded into one. And Jesus models mission. Again, part of being a kingdom of priests, we saw this in the Old Testament, was that God's people were to connect nations to God in the same way Jesus plays that role and function. And then last, Jesus as a king. When you read the accounts of Jesus' death, and we focus on the cross, um, whether out of irony or however you want to view that, the Romans put Jesus, King of the Jews, above his head when he died. And again, that was in a way done to shame him and to make fun of him in his death. But they got it exactly right, because Jesus really is the king. This goes back to David, and we talked about in the Old Testament how David becomes the model king and function as the model king. We, we talked about the Davidic covenant back in, back in 2 Samuel 7, that there would always be a son of David on the throne. And when we looked at you know, certain psalms, we read psalms such as Psalm 2. We talked about the whole business, this is my son. Today I've become your father. And so you have all these pictures in the Old Testament of Israel's king as God's son. And what does this really mean? What does it really mean to be son of God? A lot of times we think of that in biological terms, but this whole idea about being God's son is actually a title. It's a role. God's son is essentially what it means to be the Messiah. And what that means is it's God's human agent through whom God administers God's kingdom. Now, Jesus perfectly fulfills this role because not only is Jesus human, Jesus also comes as divine. So the God's Son, God's perfect Son, is the God-man, the God-human, the ultimate human, Jesus the Messiah, who comes and fulfills this role. Now, we also want to connect that other piece, because we talked a lot about, uh, in the Old Testament, we talked about David, but also remember the role of king that we saw even before David, which was back in Deuteronomy 17. And we talked about uh, the kind of king that Israel was supposed to have was Yahweh as the king. And then what did Yahweh do? Yahweh gave the Torah. 
Yahweh gave the law to function as the revealed will of Israel's true king, Yahweh, and then what was the human king supposed to do? The king was essentially the one who was going to embody and lead God's people in faithfulness. So notice how Jesus also perfectly fulfills this. Again, going back to John, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Again, part of that connects with this priestly role that God, Jesus, comes and perfectly fulfills the idea of the temple of God's presence in the midst. But also note that in the person of Jesus, in his kingly function, Jesus fully embodies the word. Jesus fully embodies uh, the king as the perfect model of faithfulness, which is a key piece. And then Jesus also fully fulfills the Davidic role of king as God's son, the human agent over his kingdom. Now, let's talk about that again. Last week, we talked a little bit about reading the Gospels missionally, and we talked about Jesus, the king, as a boundary breaker, that was the, or a boundary expander, that Jesus comes to announce the kingdom and invite outsiders to become insiders and invite insiders to more perfectly embody that ethos of the kingdom. So Jesus as king also teaches us about the kingdom. And what's the kingdom about? We talked about this again last week, where Jesus reads from Isaiah, where he talks about the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And what does Jesus do? Jesus brings what? God's age of salvation near. He does that through what? Healing. Raising the dead. Casting out devils. In other words, this is a ministry of, of liberation for God. And the kingly role was to embody the salvation that God brings, to bring wholeness to God's people, and ultimately to the whole world. So, when we think about Jesus, these three categories can help us to organize the day to the kinds of things that Jesus did in his life, in anticipation of, uh, of his death and ultimately of his resurrection. And in the next video for this week, I'm going to focus specifically upon cross and resurrection. Thank you for listening. I'm Brian Russell, and I will see you in the next video.